So using the Doppler shift to look at uh, binary stars, and that is very interesting. Lots of people spend a lot of time trying to find this kind of stuff out. But what we're interested in now really is the big picture. This is Hubble's law. You, again, you'll have studied some stuff about Hubble's law at GCSE. But this is trying to tell us what's actually happening to the universe. So we need to be, first of all, we need to understand what Hubble's law is, be able to state it. Then we need to look at this thing called the Hubble constant and actually explain its significance. And as you'll remember, I'm sure Hubble came out with a big bang theory and we need to see what other evidence there is to support this theory, which was very controversial when it was first proposed, but is now accepted by pretty much everybody. So if we look at Doppler shift, which we tend to call redshift when we're looking at light and we apply this to galaxies, okay, then the speed of movement of galaxies right, tells us a lot about what's going on in the universe. And what we notice is that apart from galaxies that are very close to us, like Andromeda, which are governed by gravitational effects, um, all the other galaxies out there have this amazing relationship, which is their velocity away from us is proportional to their distance away from us, Okay, with the constant of proportionality being called the Hubble constant, which is h or h naught. Okay, this estimate isn't quite right at the moment, but um, this is the one that's on your data sheet. So I've left this as 65 kilometers per second per megaparsec. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Okay, and this has amazing consequences for us. So understanding this very simple equation tells us about the origins of the universe and the age of the universe. Uh, something else just to mention quickly here. Um, Velocities, quite often you get a Z number, and the Z number is the recession velocity divided by the speed of light. So if the Z number, for example, is 0 0.1, that means the galaxy is moving away from us at a tenth of the speed of light. Okay, you'll be able to see from the Hubble equation that if we know the velocity of, the, of something, then we know its distance. So quite often the redshift is given as a redshift distance because the redshift and the distance are so um, closely related to each other. So how does that work in the real world? Well, uh, here's some galaxy clusters. Um, so we can we don't need to look at individual galaxies here because the whole cluster will be moving away from us. Within that cluster, we might have a certain amount of motion that we have to allow for. Here's their distances. Here's the um, spectrum coming from there. Um, a little bit tricky to see on here, but you'll notice this is a visible spectrum. Um, we're looking at particular lines in there, but here's one line. This is where it is. If it's um, done on Earth, it's been shifted to here. Here it's been shifted over here. Next one shifted to there, shifted to there, shifted to there. Why are they shifted more and more? Well, they shifted more and more because the, these galaxy clusters are moving away from us at different speeds, but they're also different distances away. So from the equation, we can relate the velocity that they're going away at to the distance where they are, and we can calculate this value for the Hubble constant in these rather tricky units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. So there's just one example here for you, Ursa Major, just to take one example. It's a billion light years away. It's moving away from us at 15,000 kilometers per second. Okay, so that's a thousand million light years. Divide that by 3.26 to turn it into parsecs. Okay, there's the equation there. So it's about 300 megaparsecs away from us it's moving at 15,000 kilometers per second so it gives us a value of 48.9 kilometers per second per megaparsec okay if you do that calculation for all these you get about the same value for each one you'll notice that value is a bit low okay from this data so it seems like all the galaxies out there are whizzing away from us um, that's not quite the idea actually um, What's actually happening is space itself is expanding, so there's a little animation here to try to make that clear. So we start off from some point in time where we've got these galaxies. Um, these galaxies are on a grid. What's happening is the grid is expanding, but you'll see that, that the effect of that is it looks as if all the other galaxies are whizzing away from us. So if we're at galaxy B, all these galaxies are whizzing away, and the further away the galaxy is, the faster it seems to be moving. If we plot all those galaxies on a graph, we get this kind of relationship that the recession velocity, the speed that it seems to be moving away from us at, right, relates quite simply to its distance in megaparsecs. That data gave us a 50.4 value for the Hubble constant. Like I said, a little bit low, 
but as long as you've understood the principle. Okay, here's a lot more data. You'll see there is a little bit of scatter. This might be due to um, variations due to gravitational effects governing local motion of things. But we can get another value for this again, so we can look on the graph. Here's our velocity. This is just over 2.6 times 10 to the 4 kilometers per second. It's 400 megaparsecs away. So that gives us the value we want, 65 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then if you look at the units for this, this is a really interesting set of units because we've got kilometers per second per megaparsec, but kilometers and megaparsecs are both units of distance. So they'll actually cancel each other out, and we'll get an answer which is per second. Okay, so if we just turn the, me the um, megaparsecs into kilometers, then we end up with this kind of equation, which gives us an age for the universe of 15 billion years. Again, you might know that's a little bit old because we're using a slightly out-of-date value for the Hubble constant. Okay, and then the last thing to think about is, well, how much of the universe have we actually included in this graph? This will become important to us later. This is 400 megaparsecs. So if we multiply that up by 3.26, that's about 13.8 billion, um, sorry, beg your pardon, that's 1,300 million light years, but the universe is uh, 13 billion light years, so this is 1.3 billion light years. We're only looking about a tenth of the universe on this part of the graph, okay? The crucial thing to understand about all this is the conclusion it brings you to, and the conclusion is that the reason these things are further away is because they're going faster and if you were to wind time backwards, all of these things would come back to a single point at the same time. So what Hubble said is, all of the galaxies out there were all formed at the same time, or at least the original matter they come from was all formed at the same time. It's been whizzing away from us ever since. If we want to take a kind of Earth-centered view of the universe, that we're at the center, which is not strictly correct, but all the things are moving away from us, and the further away, the reason they're further away is because they're moving faster. Okay, they were all formed at one point in time. If we rewind time, we get to this age for the universe, 13.8 billion years ago. All this stuff was at the same point. That was the Big Bang. That didn't convince everybody, so there's other um, evidence for the Big Bang. So the people study this, and they came out with an idea of how the matter was formed. Don't need to know too much detail on this, but basically, in the early universe, you've got protons and neutrons. Okay, we haven't formed nuclei, um, we've just got these two sorts of particles. Okay, but you might remember that protons are the only stable baryons. Neutrons will decay into protons if you leave them around long enough. So, if the universe had stayed protons and neutrons for long enough, we'd have had nothing but protons. Okay, the number of neutrons is falling, the number of protons is increasing. Okay, but when a neutron and a proton combine, then we get a deuterium nucleus, or you can get two protons and two neutrons forming a helium nucleus. Okay, and once that happens, neutron decay stops because the neutron and proton together in the deuterium nucleus are stable. Okay, so what that tells us is that if we compare the number of free protons, that's basically hydrogen nuclei, H1 nuclei, compared with the number of helium atoms, then that tells us whether that model's correct or not. The model predicted that the universe would be about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. Um, and that's pretty much what we find if we look out there. Uh, you might think that will have changed over the history of the universe because, of course, nuclear fusion is turning hydrogen into helium. But it turns out that effect is pretty insignificant and the universe is still pretty much three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium and only a tiny fraction anything else. So that was quite convincing evidence. Here's a little um, picture to hopefully make that a little bit clearer. So we start off with protons and neutrons. The universe is 3 times 10 to the 10 Kelvin. Okay. Once we go past there and we start to get free neutrons and protons, okay, the number of protons increases, the number of neutrons decreases, until we get to this kind of, this says on this one, 74, 26, slightly more precise ratio. And after that, nothing else happens because any more neutrons have decayed. The only neutrons we're left with are the ones that are trapped inside these atoms. Uh, sorry, I should say inside these nuclei. We haven't got atoms yet at this point of the universe. 
Okay, the other piece of evidence that you might have heard of is the CMBR, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. The argument for this goes uh, as follows. So when the universe started, there was just a fog of particles, okay? This is because we haven't got atoms. We've got nuclei and we've got electrons wandering around free. And if you shine radiation through that, the electrons can absorb any kind of energy of particle. So any photon that's coming through the universe just gets absorbed and re-transmitted in a different direction. And none of that light is really left. It's all been absorbed um, until we get to 380,000 years old. Because at 380,000 years, the universe is cooled enough so the electrons are going around the nuclei and we've got atoms. If you think what you know about absorption spectrum, a photon um, that goes through an atom will probably pass straight through unless it happens to have just the right amount of energy to create an absorption line. Okay, And the universe was about 3,000 Kelvin at this time. So this is like a black body radiation. It's given off radiation of something that's 3,000 Kelvin. Um, before that, the light's all gone. It's all been absorbed. But this light still tr is traveling through the universe. We can see this as background radiation. But we have to remember that this has been very redshifted because we're looking right back to the early universe. So we're looking a long way away, which means we're looking a long way back in time. Okay, so it's now stretched. So this lambda max peak here that we'll see in a sec, this would be um, somewhere in the near infrared. But in fact, it's redshifted right down to the microwave background levels. Okay, here's an amazing graph. It looks like you've plotted some points and then you've put a curve through them. But in fact, that's not right. The curve is the black body curve for something that's 2.7 Kelvin. And the dots are the measurements made by the COBE satellite. And you'll see that the dots incredibly closely follow that curve. Um, and you can work for, out from that the temperature of the universe. So this says 2.7, but actually if you use the numbers we've got, you end up with Vine's Law. It says lambda max equals kT. So T is the peak of this about um, 0.105 centimetres. So 0.0105 metres divided by the Vine constant give us about 3.5 Kelvin. Remember, this isn't telling you the universe was 3.5 Kelvin. It was 3,000 Kelvin. But that radiation has been redshifted all the way down into the microwave region.